All right, we're now live with a 20 second delay. Well, I think then since uh, we'll hear, people will be hearing what uh, we're saying in just a couple of minutes, so I think I'll get started and welcome um, the audience, uh, both our local uh, Zoom participants, uh, as well as the, the broader audience uh, that is watching and uh, hopefully commenting on YouTube. Um, uh, welcome, my name is Jeremy Levy. I'm the director of the Pittsburgh Quantum Institute and I'm really delighted to be able to uh, introduce the, uh, the inaugural PQI Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, uh, and the, so the first uh, lecture series will uh, be given by uh, Professor Hideo Mabuchi from Stanford University. Um, so what, uh, what distinguishes the lecture series, of course, is uh, in addition to having very distinguished speakers, uh, is that we also paired this up with uh, an extended interview. Uh, and I know some of you have already seen the interview, but if you haven't, uh, that link will be maybe uh, posted on the comment section. You can watch it. Don't watch it at the same time, but you can watch it afterwards. Um, so, uh, so Hideo Mabuchi is, as I said, is a professor from, uh, from Stanford University. He was at Caltech before that. Um, uh, and he's had a longstanding interest in uh, quantum uh, control and coherence uh, with an eye towards um, using uh, quantum mechanics for uh, purposes of new forms of computation. And I think that um, maybe should be interpreted very broadly. Um, and so today, he's going to be giving a uh, lecture um, and the title is Coherent Nonlinear Dynamics and the Physics of Computation. So thank you so much, Hideo, for being here. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Um, thank you for the invitation to uh, be here today. It's a great opportunity uh, and it's wonderful to uh, meet the PQI community. And I, I look forward to having some discussions around this. Um, should I just go ahead and share screen? Is that going to work? Yeah. So while you're uh, setting up your screen, I'll also just say that that we're hoping that this will be a very, sort of an inter very interactive um, discussion, and I encourage uh, the our Zoom participants um, to uh, to ask questions um, and maybe even interrupt uh, the, the speaker. So he's uh, he's um, okay with being interrupted uh, during the talk, um, and then we'll also have question time for questions. Um, uh, if there's something that's really uh, pertinent to something happening immediately, although there's a 20 second delay, uh, we can try to work that in, but otherwise we'll have questions that, at the end uh, coming in from our uh, external audience. So take it away. Hey, Jeremy, are you recording this? This is really um, It's actually being streamed, live streamed, and so there will be a record um, through a YouTube link. Hey, great. Thank you. Um, so the title is uh, rather broad, but really for most of the presentation, I'd like to focus on talking about coherent easing machines, which is a particular uh, kind of emerging unconventional architecture for combinatorial optimization problems. Um, but where in the first part of the talk, what I'll try to do is motivate um, our interest or the community's interest in this type of architecture uh, based on its possible application to computing applications of widespread interest. But then I'm going to transition gradually into talking more about kind of the background science behind coherent easing machines. And I'll kind of end up in what may seem like a rather different place. But where it's going to go is I want to kind of talk first about coherent easing machines in general, why they're interesting, but then go towards aspects of the physics that I think are really um, uniquely emphasized in this kind of work uh, to relate it a little bit to things that my group has been working on for some time. And hopefully to uh, leave you with a sense of the excitement that we have in terms of uh, CIMs, coherent easing machines, as kind of a, a motivating um, umbrella for uh, a number of topics in coherent nonlinear dynamics and the physics of computation. Um, so I'm very lucky to be part of a community, uh, a, a quite interdisciplinary community who are, is interested in this set of topics. So in addition uh, to myself and some students from my group, um, we are collaborating these days with uh, Surya Ganguly uh, Marty Fair and Amir Safavi Naini, all in the Department of Applied Physics at Stanford University. And we as well have a, a strong ongoing collaboration with Yoshi Yamamoto, formerly uh, from our department at Stanford, uh, but now leading uh, an effort at the NTT5 Research Labs. Um, I should acknowledge some funding sources. So going forward, 
uh, most of this work on coherent easy machines is supported um, by a combination of funding from the National Science Foundation uh, under an Expeditions in Computing Award, uh, as well as um, a major uh, contract from NTT Research. Uh, I'd also like to say that uh, my own groups were kind of leading into this, uh, that kind of positioned us to have something to contribute to the effort um, was supported by the AMO program at the NSF, uh, as well as the Army Research Office. So um, many, if not most of you will already be familiar with the easing model, uh, but let me just um, quickly rem uh, go over it to uh, remind you or, or introduce it to you. <clears throat> so the model that we have in mind is something like a network of spins. So these will be two level spins. And in a classical formulation of the model, you would just say that these spins have values of either plus or minus one. And kind of looking into a quasi quantum context, you could imagine that as being like the Z component of the spin of the A spin half particle. So we have some number of these. And in general, we're going to be interested in models that have a large number of spins. Uh, but then we also imagine that the spins are interacting in some uh, kind of abstract way, where between any given pair of spins, uh, you may have an interaction energy term that's characterized by some scalar coefficient, uh, generally Jij. So then the overall uh, Hamiltonian for a model like this would look something like a sum of local terms, right? So you may imagine that you have something like a local magnetic field acting on each spin, which uh, gives it its own energy term, just uh, corresponding to whether that spin is aligned with or anti-aligned with the local field. But then uh, kind of more interestingly, you may have these uh, this set of interaction terms between the spins. And so here, um, when we draw a model like this as a, as a kind of graph with spins at the nodes and um, interaction coefficients on the edges, we usually imagine that this is an undirected graph, which is to say that you know, there's just a single number that characterizes the interaction between any given pair of spins. So that if we write out the sum of all the interaction energies in a term like this, we would write it as the sum on i and j, but only for i less than j of a, a set of coefficients j i j, and then the product of the spin values sigma i sigma j. Um, so as you may know, uh, calculating the ground state uh, of the easing Hamiltonian is a hard problem. So what exactly do we mean by that? Um, I think especially in the days of uh, quantum computing, this uh, era that we're living in now, at least in academia, um, many of you will be familiar with this uh, whole idea of P versus NP. Uh, but just you know, roughly speaking, P is kind of like a, a space of computational problems that are generally considered to be tractable. Generally, they can be solved by some algorithm that has only polynomial runtime in the size of the problem instance. Whereas NP is a broader class of uh, problems which generally are considered to be not tractable as we go to very large problem size. So if we think about um, the problem of finding the ground state of an easing Hamiltonian, we can formulate that problem in uh, two related ways. There's a decision version of the ground state problem for the easing Hamiltonian, which is just to ask for a given problem instance, right? So that is, for a given number of spins and for a given specific choice of this set of uh, coefficients j i j, we can ask, well, if you just think hypothetically about the ground state, is the ground state energy less than or equal to some uh, threshold epsilon? So that's a yes or no problem. And so if we formulate the problem in that way, then uh, this is the decision version of the ground state problem for the easing Hamiltonian. And what's known about it is that this is an NP complete problem, which is to say that if we think about all of the other decision problems in NP, they can all be reduced to or made equivalent to the decision version of the ground state easing problem uh, by some kind of polynomial time reduction. Generally though, for applications, we're interested in a slightly different formulation, which is just to specify the number of spins and the coupling matrix j i j and to ask what is the ground state energy. And so in the kind of usual, very specific lingo that you encounter in comp a computational complexity theory, you would say that the easing decision problem is NP complete that the easing optimization problem is NP hard, but kind of all I really think we need to take away from this slide is to just have in mind that easing optimization, which is what we're gonna focus on, it's kind of a representative hard problem uh, for, for computational optimization. Um, so we have to dig into that a little bit more though. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, it's representative in the sense that other hard optimization problems can be mapped onto easing optimization. There's a very nice recent review article in Frontiers in Physics cited here where you can uh, look at the details of some of those. But then also, you know, if you think about applications, I would venture to say that it's very hard to come up with an application context 
in which it's really super important to you to find the absolute ground state of something like an easing Hamiltonian. In practice, much more often what you tend to be interested in uh, is you would like to get a very good solution. That is, you would like to identify a very low energy uh, state, which has uh, energy, let's say, very close to that of the ground state. And you would like to be able to do that quickly. That's much more often the kind of uh, uh, challenge that you uh, encounter for, uh, for practical applications. And so correspondingly, although finding the exact ground state is an NP-hard problem, uh, what we much more often do uh, is turn to so-called heuristic algorithms, which are computational approaches that don't generally give you any guarantee about finding the absolute ground state or anything like that. However, uh, the uh, aim of these sorts of heuristic algorithms is to give you a very good solution in a reasonably uh, short amount of time. Um, now, the other thing to be said about that, as you might imagine, um, if we think about even at fixed number of spins, if we imagine all of the different kind of structures or topologies that you could have in this matrix of interaction terms, JIJ, there's gonna be lots of qualitatively different looking graphs. And so um, you might imagine that um, among the whole set of different heuristic approaches that are known for trying to find good solutions to optimization problems, some heuristic algorithms might be good for a certain class of problem instances, and a different heuristic algorithm might be better for a different class of uh, problem instances. And so generally, there's a sort of loose empirical um, uh, idea, uh, which is sometimes called performance complementarity, which um, codifies this as uh, in a kind of an empirical observation that in these sorts of hard combinatorial optimizations, it, it's good in a sense to have a portfolio of different heuristic approaches because for any given optimization uh, problem instance that you might be confronted with, uh, some of these algorithms might be better than others. And so um, this is maybe the right place to introduce connections to uh, physics and particularly to uh, quantum science as it is evolving these days. Um, and so you may be familiar um, with uh, an approach called quantum adiabatic optimization. Um, so uh, sometimes also called adiabatic quantum computing, or maybe you would say that adiabatic uh, optimization is a subset of adiabatic quantum computing. But anyway, the idea is to um, try to uh, imagine a real spin system, so a register of qubits. And uh, the algorithm or the approach to trying to find the ground state is the following. You, uh, uh, on the one hand, write down or try to implement the Hamiltonian that you're actually interested in, right? So some sort of easing Hamiltonian, let's say. But then uh, you'll also uh, have a term in the Hamiltonian that corresponds to some sort of just a base Hamiltonian whose ground state is actually really easy to prepare. But actually what you want to do is to make the total Hamiltonian um, that the spins are uh, experiencing, you want to make that time dependent. And you want to kind of ramp between these two different terms. So that um, for very small t, mostly the Hamiltonian that the spins are um, experiencing is this basic simple Hamiltonian for which you've been able to very accurately just initialize these spins into the ground state of H naught. But then as time goes forward, you start to ramp that term down and then you start to ramp up the amplitude of this other part, which would correspond, uh, for example, to an easing Hamiltonian like this. And uh, you know, the idea here is that if you're able to go sufficiently slowly, that you would, ex uh, you would um, uh, hope for the quantum state of the register to always stay in the instantaneous ground state of the total Hamiltonian, right? The kind of uh, picture that you might follow would look something like this. And this is actually a graphic that's taken from the um, documentation page, uh, pages over at D-Wave Systems. But so you would start here in the prepared ground state of H0, and then as time uh, evolves, you would move over into the ground state of the, let's say, easing Hamiltonian. But then the difficulty of all this is that you generally expect that at some point during that adiabatic evolution, um, excited states uh, will start to come uh, maybe exponentially close to the ground state that you're trying to follow. And so in order to avoid a kind of a landau zener tunneling, or basically just to avoid non-adiabatic jumping into excited states that you don't want, you might have to go really extremely slowly uh, through these um, bottleneck transition regions. And of course, if we're talking about a realistic quantum system, uh, it's uh, extremely unlikely that you will be able to perfectly pr preserve coherence for a large number of spins over a long period of time. Uh, and so in, in practice, this is, this is kind of a difficulty. So if you actually look at the, um, the approach that's used in something like the D-Wave quantum annealer, um, as I'm sure most of you have seen, uh, D-Wave Systems is a, a company of growing size, which is actually producing a uh, commercially available uh, quantum annealing uh, computer 
based on superconducting circuit uh, technology. And so what they implement in the D-Wave quantum annealers is something closely related to quantum adiabatic optimization, but a little bit different. And so you have the same idea that you're going to gradually ramp between some initial uh, kind of basic Hamiltonian and uh, ultimately you'll switch over to the easing Hamiltonian. Um, but this, unlike uh, the simplest picture of uh, quantum adiabatic optimization, we acknowledge that a realistic spin system in present day technology is always going to be in contact with some sort of a heat bath at a temperature uh, which we can try to make as small as possible using cryogenics or other refrigeration technology, but that temperature is always going to be finite. Um, and then the uh, specific approach of quantum annealing is to choose that um, initial uh, basic Hamiltonian to specifically be the sum of uh, sigma x on each of the spin terms individually. And so the way that you can think of this term here, it's sort of like even though the computationally meaningful basis states for each of the spins is up or down, let's say along the z direction, and so you want to end up there, and you can see from the form of the easing Hamiltonian that its ground state is going to be a product of just ups and downs. However, this initial uh, base Hamiltonian that you prepare is something that would have large transverse magnetic fields. And so uh, to go into the ground state of that as your initial preparation, you might imagine that you're actually going into something like the plus x state for each of the spins individually. And so there will be kind of maximum quantum uncertainty uh, in the z basis for each of the spins starting out with. And so what happens then as you ramp between this initial uh, sigma x Hamiltonian and ultimately the easing Hamiltonian, as you're kind of uh, going from a situation of maximum uh, quantum uncertainty in the z direction of the spins, but eventually you're going into a situation where you expect all of the spins to be in a sigma z eigenstate, but where the particular combination of spins will be controlled by the, um, the interaction terms in the, in the easing Hamiltonian. And then kind of as you're doing the switchover, you also have sort of this idea that um, you know, this initial state that you're starting at is uh, going to be kind of a high energy state uh, by definition. But then this contact with a finite heat bath, it's kind of like there's a cooling that's going on. So that whatever initial state you prepare, as you start to turn down the scale of the quantum uncertainty and you allow the kind of energy landscape to uh, relax into what's going to be the easing problem landscape, at the same time, this contact with a low energy uh, heat bath is trying to cool you in the sense that you try to settle down into lower and lower energy states. So um, in the very early days of talking about coherent easing machines, um, uh, kind of building on that uh, prior work or those previous approaches, um, it was tempting uh, to define coherent easing machines in the following language uh, with reference uh, to this particular um, diagram over here. So if you would imagine uh, very abstractly that along the horizontal as uh, axis of this diagram, we're laying out various different spin configurations that your uh, register might have, um, you could uh, say that the easing Hamiltonian establishes some sort of energy landscape. And um, some standard approaches that you might consider trying to use as heuristic approaches to finding the ground state of this energy landscape, so the, the global minimum energy in this energy landscape, uh, would first of all, could be something like classical annealing, so in classical annealing, there's nothing quantum going on at all. You just imagine first uh, trying to put a spin system like this um, in, in contact with a very high temperature uh, heat bath. So you can imagine that at that high temperature, your thermal equilibrium state will be sort of some cloud that's a little bit lumpy, uh, reflecting somehow the ups and downs of this energy landscape. But the idea is that as you cool, if you lower the temperature of the heat bath slowly, you would expect to be cooling down to lower and lower energy states in this landscape. But at any finite temperature, there would still be equilibrium fluctuations, which would give you some probability or some mechanism for trying to uh, escape from local minima uh, that are um, far above the energy of the actual global minimum that you're trying to get to. Right? So in classical annealing, there's this idea of gradually lowering the temperature and relying on uh, thermal statistical fluctuations to get you out of local traps. In quantum annealing, like in the D-wave annealer, the idea is similar in that um, you're turning down this uh, very highly exciting transverse magnetic field Hamiltonian and trying to cool into the baseline temperature of the heat bath of your, of your quantum annealer. But now instead of necessarily relying on classical statistical thermal fluctuations to get you out of um, local minima, there's an idea that this uh, transverse uncertainty or this this um, uncertainty in the, the Z component of the spin associated with uh, actually tilting your spins coherently up to the equator of the block sphere, 
that this will give you the ability to do something like tunneling out of local minima. And it's an open question which one of these approaches is necessarily better in any given uh, instance, but quantum annealing is, uh, if nothing else, sort of a distinct approach uh, as a heuristic for solving these kinds of problems. But both of these annealing approaches, right, really kind of what you worry is that, especially as you get down to low temperatures or uh, low trans transverse magnetic fields, you're trying to bring the expected state of the spin register down, down, down in this energy landscape. But as you get to low temperature or low transverse magnetic field, right, your mechanisms for trying to get out of local traps, those, uh, you know, the rates of those escapes are being turned down as well. And so in either of those cases, you do feel like the main obstacle to obtaining very good solutions is going to be getting stuck in, in local minima. So uh, I should say, as far as I know, the idea of coherent easing machines is really something that was initially proposed by our colleague Yoshi Yamamoto. And in its uh, current form, relying on a, a network of couple, coupled op optical parametric oscillators, I believe this is something that emerged out of conversations that he was having with Bob Beyer. Um, but uh, you know, the, um, the kind of uh, current picture of the CIM architecture, which I'll explain in just a second, um, it's, a, it's not at all anything like quantum adiabatic optimization uh, in the sense that it's not even trying to be purely Hamiltonian, right? So the CIM architecture as currently implemented is a dissipative system and it's a driven dissipative system. Um, and uh, rather than having a temperature as kind of a parameter that you can ramp or a magnetic field as a parameter that you can ramp to go from the beginning to the end of your optimization algorithm, there's instead something that's like a pump power that's uh, for a bunch of optical devices. And so the way that this thing sets up, uh, you can kind of envision that what you're trying to do is rather than starting from high energy states and coming down as in annealing approaches, sort of the idea of the CAM as a driven dissipative system is to try to sneak up on this global energy minimum from below. Right. In a very loose qualitative sense, you can see the appeal of this idea, right? Like if, if it, there actually is some way to try to sneak up on the global minimum in the energy landscape coming up from below, then you might reason that this should be an approach which would be less susceptible to becoming trapped in local minima. And the idea of that is that uh, in a system like this, there's a pump uh, strength, which corresponds liter literally to some laser strength, uh, which is being coupled into a lithium niobate waveguide. And uh, what we know from basic physical considerations is that um, at low pump powers, um, the optical states um, circulating in the coherent easing machine will be more or less vacuum states. Uh, but because of properties of optical parametric oscillators that again, I'll get to in a minute, you will eventually hit a kind of threshold, which is a sort of a lazing threshold. And the initial idea of the um, configuration of the CIM architecture was to say that when the OPO pump power or the network gain is sufficiently low, the only stable state for the system is really a vacuum. So it's really like nothing, right? There are really no degrees of freedom that you could call spins at all. But then when you hit a sort of lazing transition, um, the system will pop up into something that you could interpret as a spin configuration. And um, the goal of the architecture or the idea of the architecture was to try to design couplings among different optical degrees of freedom so that when you did finally hit a threshold and uh, pop into finite amplitudes for your, for your parametric oscillators, you might hope that it would just jump straight into the, the um, global minimum configuration because kind of the, the lowest loss configuration out of all uh, possible um, uh, oscillator amplitudes, the lowest loss one is kind of the one that you expect to laze first, right? Just to use a, a sort of an analogy from, from basic laser physics. It turns out, so, so these sorts of machines have been implemented. I'll, I'll give you a feeling for that in, in the next few slides. But maybe the thing I should say here is this, this remains a sort of inspirational idea in what we're doing in the, the community of people working on coherent easing machines. However, I think what we've come to understand in the last few years is that the real picture of what's happening is actually much more complicated than this. And um, that's actually something that to me makes it a, a, a even more interesting system to study from a physics perspective or let's say from a physics of computation perspective, um, but it's definitely more complicated than this. Um, so uh, let me just, you know, before getting more into the, the details of uh, what this is, well, actually, let me remind myself how I set this up. Um, uh, yeah, so before getting more into the technical details of what's in the hardware of a coherent easing machine, let me make a few more uh, comments of a general nature. 
So um, by not choosing to start with something like a qubit register, right? We're working with a system where the uh, fundamental degrees of freedom for the pieces of our coherent easing machine, they're actually fundamentally continuous analog systems, right? They're things like oscillators that have X's and P's. So really the, the phase space of the coherent easing machine, if you will, it's something that has continuous variables in it. It's not something that naturally is something that has dis a discrete binary nature, right? So in a way, it's an odd match for something like the combinatorial optimization problem where in the end, the problem that you want to solve for finding a, a ground state or near ground state of an easing Hamiltonian, you want to have binary variables that are just plus or minus one. So one of the things that we're doing in an approach like this is to embed a binary combinatorial optimization problem within the continuous analog dynamics of a physical system. And it's a physical system that has a tunable, tunable parameter such as the, the pump strength. And so uh, for related reasons, you know, I would say that coherent easing machine is really, it's very distinct from mainstream quantum computing. Um, as we'll talk about uh, here, um, the role of things like entanglement is probably zero in current implementations of the um, coherent easing machine and is likely to remain small in the foreseeable future, although other kinds of quantum effects may uh, be playing a role. Um, it's quite different from the sort of quantum adiabatic optimization that I talked about a couple of slides ago in that this really is a driven dissipative system, but it's also, quite different from other sorts of approaches that um, are being pursued in the engineering community to try to make similar kinds of um, analog dynamic simulators of easing, uh, of easing Hamiltonians um, that would be purely electronic, right? So the um, current generation of coherent easing machines is a hybrid optical electronic kind of system where um, a way that you might characterize it is that optics are used for um, uh, kind of storage of the of the variables in the optimization and in fact we have those optical fields circulating in a long optical fiber loop and only kind of once per um, round trip all of these optical variables kind of come into a region where things might happen to them but it's a uh, that storage ring um, kind of uh, uh, architecture ends up being ends up having some major advantages uh, and you know in setting up all that kind of thing we're exploiting considerable advances in photonics fiber optics and laser sources since uh, 1980s style optical computing, right? Like many times when you uh, talk to people who have uh, been in physics of computation for some time, they'll complain that, oh, optical computing was uh, tried and actually quite a lot of effort was put into it back in the 1980s, but it eventually fizzled. But really uh, optical technology has um, of course evolved quite a, long, uh, quite a lot since then. Um, but then uh, the, the uh, dominant current coherent easing machine architectures also rely quite heavily on more or less conventional electronic computing in the form of uh, what can be quite a large bank of field programmable gate arrays, which um, implement a very important uh, logical core or arithmetic core of the um, CIM architecture. And that we utilize FPGAs to do um, a continuous string of uh, large vector matrix multiplies. And so kind of what's happening is that uh, rather than a, a sort of typical CPU architecture where you have a, an arithmetic unit and then electronic memory and things have to keep kind of going back and forth, you have sort of a stationary um, electronic uh, arithmetic engine and then your variables are stored in an optical loop. And so your variables keep coming around and around and around again to this one place where the electronic computation is happening. And so in a sense, you might uh, say that this hybrid kind of optoelectronic architecture tries to use optics for what it's good for, that is moving things around with very low loss and at very high speed, but it's also using electronics for something that it's good for, which is very fast, very low energy um, uh, computation in place. I should say that um, there are some other things going on in the physics community. I, I would note, especially recent papers by uh, Conti's group and near Davidson's group, uh, which are very similar in spirit to the CIM, but um, make different sorts of partitioning in terms of what's done optically versus what's done electronically. Um, and you know, maybe what I'll say is uh, a characteristic of the CIM approach that I'm talking about here is that the optics is in charge of this kind of uh, circulation of the, of the state variables, but it also is something that provides a nonlinearity in the dynamics, which I'll try to convince you is a, a critical thing. And then the uh, linear couplings that you have, if you remember in the, um, the easing machine, uh, the uh, easing Hamiltonian, those JIJ couplings are actually taken care of by the, by the electronics. 
So if I so can ask you a quick, a quick question. Um, so it seems to me is that, that this that this kind of hybrid architecture where you've given some role for a conventional um, electronics or computing processing, but then you've got this, the optical part is something that is quite, I would say aligned and maybe Michael can comment on this, that with you know how uh, all the requirements or what we think would be required for quantum computing and in some sense having this sort of fast uh, feedback control um, is something that, uh, uh, I, I, yeah, as I said, would seems like it would be very um, well suited as a uh, even as a model for how you know some approaches uh, that would be uh, quantum or quantum may need to uh, they may need to borrow you know from these kinds of architectures or take take advantage of the what uh, the frameworks that you're developing. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I mean, I, I think that's certainly that there's a coherent part, there's a kind of coherent subsystem, and then there's a supervisory or kind of a control subsystem where, in which the majority of the logic maybe is of a classical logic nature. I mean, I think it's, I think, I think you're quite right that that's a, a maybe um, a quite common kind of partitioning that you will find in, in, in quantum information technology. <laughs> I'll offer some ideas towards the end of the talk about how we might um, directly try to generalize the same architecture to do things that are more uh, explicitly quantum mechanical. Um, yeah, which actually, so that uh, nicely brings me to the last point that I was gonna make. So overall in CIM, I would say we have kind of an unconven unconventional computing architecture, which I would characterize uh, with what we know now, it's kind of a heuristic approach to finding very good solutions of uh, easing problems uh, with a, with short late, with a very low latency. And I think because of the way that it sets up, it's easy to see how you could generalize the architecture somewhat to try to support um, transient entanglement or kind of local entanglement or uh, things like that. So it's a it's a kind of setup where it's easy to see how you push it gradually into a more quantum mechanical regime of operation. Uh, it's quite unclear what sort of advantages or disadvantages those might have in terms of um, their effects on the speed of solving optimization problems. But I think that because you know there's almost like a, an, a continuous slider bar that you can imagine <clears throat> for CIMs operating in a classical coherent nonlinear optical regime to a fully quantum regime, I think that makes it a very interesting kind of paradigm in which to ask questions about what's going on in computation and information processing Kind of in between the clean classical and, and quantum mechanical limits, which is a sort of research topic that we uh, that I think is very important to the long term health of our field. The one which I think we don't have so many concrete um, examples of uh, real model systems in which to ask those kinds of questions. Okay, so um, let me build up to a somewhat more detailed picture of what the CIM architecture is, um, just by. Starting, um, I just want to remind you about optical parametric oscillators. Um, so what I have in mind as an OPO is, a, is an optical system that you could schematically write down like this. So there's some sort of optical resonator generally. So here I'm just drawing a bow tie optical resonator with two curved mirrors and two flat mirrors. And so if you have resonant light circulating inside this kind of a bow tie, it basically just follows this figure eight pattern, right? And so resonant, meaning that the light has to fit an integral number of wavelengths into the length of the round trip uh, path. And then also the curved mirrors here kind of help to keep that beam collimated. So within that um, resonator, you need to introduce a chi 2 optical crystal. Um, here we'll mainly be talking about lithium niobate as kind of the preferred state-of-the-art material. Um, but now rather than actually injecting any signal light into a device like this, the idea is to only pump it with the second harmonic of what's going to resonate in the, in the resonator. So you can imagine that is if you're pumping with a green laser, so you're pumping the lithium niobate with a green laser, a kind of process that can happen would be a parametric down conversion, where you would take a green photon, split it into two red photons. And if you arrange all the frequencies right, those down converted red photons might be resonant to circulate uh, in the, in the, um, in the bow tie cavity mode. And so sort of what you would imagine is, well, um, you know, the reflectivities of these mirrors are not 100%. There are going to be various transmission and scattering losses, some absorption and scattering within the lithium nitrate crystal. And um, usually what you do is you open up one of these mirrors a little bit and give it a finite transmissivity so that you can actually get some light out to make measurements on in a device like this. But sort of what you expect is that when the pump power is relatively low, so that the rate of um, parametric down conversion into the signal mode is small compared to the rate at which the circulating signal photons would escape from the cavity, 
you don't build up any coherent amplitude of signal in a cavity like that. But if you were to just keep increasing the strength of the pump, you would eventually hit a point where the rate of down conversion is equal to the rate of loss. And as soon as you hit that threshold, your signal can actually start to amplify and build up in the cavity and you'll go above something which is kind of like a lasing threshold, right? So you'll actually then have also a stimulated down conversion of photons into the, uh, from the pump down to the signal mode. Now, an interesting thing about it um, is that if you analyze the, the uh, kind of full coherent dynamics of a system like this, it's true that there's a, that there's a sharp threshold. Um, and it's a classic, if you analyze it classically, it's a very clean example of something that we would call a pitchfork bifurcation, where um, if you just think about um, uh, you know, equations of motion for the signal in pump amplitudes, you could draw a diagram like this, where um, going vertically up this diagram is like increasing the strength of the pump. Um, and horizontally is some sort of uh, depiction of the amplitude of the signal field. So when the pump strength is relatively low, like the stable uh, configuration is for there to be zero coherent mean for the signal mode uh, circulating inside the cavity. But then you hit this kind of lasing threshold and suddenly what happens is that you're gonna build up a coherent amplitude of the signal field. But as it turns out, when you look at the uh, details of the equations for this sort of parametric down conversion, um, this can happen and be stable either for a phase of the signal field, which is aligned with um, the phase of the pump or one that's pi out of phase with the phase of the pump. And so in fact, um, in this sort of a bifurcation diagram, when you hit that threshold, the original um, uh, uh, vacuum state becomes unstable and it gets replaced by a pair of new stable states, one of which is at positive phase and one of which is at negative phase relative to the pump. Um, and if you uh, analyze the same kind of transition, but in more quantum optical terms, uh, some interesting things that you find that we'll come back to later are that below threshold in an optical parametric oscillator. So the below threshold degenerate OPO is actually very well known as a system for producing squeezed vacuum, right? So in the uh, quantum case, when you're below threshold, especially when you're just below threshold, um, the stable state or the, the steady state of a system like this is actually not just a vacuum state, but a squeezed vacuum state. Uh, but then once you pop above, above the threshold, um, that squeezed vacuum state gets replaced as the steady state by uh, one of two possible uh, displaced coherent states, again, either aligned with or anti-aligned with the pump. So, you know, coming back to our problem of solving easing optimization problems and this idea of kind of approaching a global minimum from below, the idea of just a single OPO is something like when the pump value is really small, you have no spin at all. You just have a vacuum state of some kind. But then once you pop up through the leasing transition, now you suddenly have a bit, right? Because this uh, question of whether the signal field is aligned with or anti-aligned with the pump phase, well, that's a bit of information. It's something that we can think of as being kind of like an easing spin. So now just to, to map that a little bit further, imagine that we have on our optical table, not just one OPO, but two of them. Well, if these two OPOs are not coupled to one another at all, and if we imagine that they're identical, then if you were to draw something like a bifurcation diagram for these guys, it would just be two independent copies of this pitchfork bifurcation. Right, so if the two OPOs are experiencing exactly the same pump power, then below threshold, these are both just sitting at zero, some kind of squeeze vacuum. But then once you hit the threshold, um, both of the OPOs will pop up into some coherent amplitude. Uh, but you know, you you might imagine that both of them will be random and independent, right? So basically, what you'll do is you'll just generate two random bits of information as you come above threshold, right? The OPOs will settle into a plus plus or plus minus or minus plus or minus minus and any of those alternatives has the same probability. Um, you know, in a quantum setting, you might imagine that sort of what happens is that this squeezing gets amplified and pulled out and there's kind of an initial quantum uncertainty that gets projected into being a plus or minus state um, uh, once you come above threshold. Classically, you might imagine that what you do is uh, as soon as you come above threshold, you kind of amplify some sort of technical noise which decides which state you come in. But in any case, all you really do is generate two random bits of information if we have uncoupled OPOs. But now imagine we have a situation like this where these two OPOs are actually injection locked to one another, right? So some of what's coming out of the uh, say number one OPO down here gets injected into the second OPO at the top. And some of what's coming out of the second OPO at the top gets injected into the lower end at the bottom. You could imagine that this mutual injection coupling is gonna change something about the threshold. It may in fact create a new bifurcation point where for a pump power below what you would have expected in the independent OPOs case, it, it will be possible for these uh, two OPOs to come up above threshold if they mutually reinforce each other in just the right way. 
And of course, what it's going to take for them to mutually reinforce each other is going to depend on the phase shifts of these two injection couplings. And so you start to see how it might be possible to encode something like an easing problem in the set of coupling coefficients between a, a number of coupled optical parametric oscillators. Right, so the idea being very explicitly that as you gradually raise the pump power up from zero, what you would hope is that maybe once these things actually undergo a lasing transition, the first lasing transition they hit would be to come into a set of um, displaced coherent states where the sign structure of that set of displaced coherent states uh, would correspond to the ground state of, of an easing Hamiltonian like this. Uh, can, so I, can I ask yeah. a quick question here? Sure. Uh, sure. I've been working with uh, Peter, who is now at Cornell, I guess he's uh, from your group. Um, the fact that there is no H sigma uh, term, right, um, uh, limits kind of uh, problems that we can solve, right? So, it, because every time I give him an input to play with, he's able to do only the JIJ versions and you know, he lands up getting zero all the time. So. What is a way of quickly getting the H sigma term in uh, in in this kind of a uh, CIM machine? I mean, I think you know. So what I'm drawing here is what we'll call a coherent feedback um, uh, or coherent coupling um, CIM architecture, where you are sort of limited to just only having the uh, off-diagonal terms here. But in the in the present um, measurement feedback terms, I think it's actually just as straightforward to put the diagonals on there. So if you want to have local magnetic, uh, magnetic field terms, you can do that also in the kind of current generation of large scale prototypes. Um, it, it, that may be more, more sense in a, in a minute after I show a diagram of that. Uh, yeah, so uh, setting up a, a pair of OPOs like this and getting them coupled, that's certainly something that one can do um, for almost completely unrelated reasons. It's the sort of thing that we were um, involved with in my group in the past, but um, maybe I'll just say that uh, it's kind of complicated. <laughs> you know, if you're really trying to go to a limit of large n in a system like this, I don't necessarily recommend literally having uh, bow tie resonator, op resonator OPOs um, on your tabletop and trying to mutually injection lock them. Um, there's a lot of path length stabilization involved in trying to do something like that. So, um, you know, where the field has gone instead uh, was to uh, uh, take advantage of recent developments in the field of what are called synchronously pumped OPOs. And so, in fact, one of the first physical implementations of a coherent easing machine was basically like a time domain multiplex version of a four spin system, very much along the lines of uh, what I was just showing um, in the previous slide. So what happens now is that you again have a bow tie resonator with a, period, with a lithium niobate crystal in it. But now instead of thinking about there being a CW uh, resonant mode in the cavity, the pump laser is not a, a CW pump but it's actually a pulsed pump laser. And so what you try to do is to um, make the pulse rate of the pump exactly synchronized with, the, uh, uh, with some harmonic of the round trip time around the cavity, right? So that if you're pulsing at, at the right rate, every pump pulse that comes through can undergo a little bit of parametric down conversion. It will create a little uh, pulse of squeeze vacuum, let's say, which then travels around the bow tie resonator and comes back. And what you want to have happen is that when this little, uh, signal packet comes back to the lithium ibit crystal, it's exactly lined up with another pump pulse which is coming by. And so um, you obviously don't have to wait, like if the bandwidth of the down conversion process and if the, uh, the shortness of the pump pulse is, is sufficient, then you can make these little packets which will be localized with respect to the round trip path length. And you can have a train of such OPO pulses circulating around this setup at any given time. Um, you know, and so you have to obviously arrange all the timing right but this gives you a way to just have one optical parametric oscillator cavity, a single lithium niobate crystal, but now a pumped pulse, and you can time multiplex a number of time bins in here uh, to make a, a much larger number of effective uh, OPO degrees of freedom. And so in the original uh, experiments at Stanford, there was something where uh, in a mutual injection uh, uh, kind of setup was used to implement the couplings, where there would be beam splitters that would tap off a bit of a pulse, delay it, and so when it got reintroduced on another beam splitter in the cavity, it would land on top of a, um, the following pulse, let's say. And so a delay line architecture like this is a way that you could at least do things like nearest neighbor couplings in a time domain uh, multiplexed uh, OPO network. But uh, 
you know, even this sort of thing, you could imagine that, well, this is nearest neighbor couplings, but, you know, as you um, want to increase the number of different couplings so that you have not just nearest neighbors, but next to nearest neighbors, or let's say that you actually want to go to a really large number of pulses and you would actually like all to all couple possibilities to get to some of the, you know, really difficult instances of something like an easing uh, optimization. Um, this sort of coherent coupling mechanism has lots of drawbacks. Not the least of which is that you're always kind of removing power from the pulses for every coupling that you want to implement. And then um, from a quantum noise point of view, you're introducing all these beam splitters. And so um, if you're interested in looking at the effects of squeezing in something like this, you're actually constantly degrading the squeezing because of this sort of thing. Um, so the kind of approach that really has um, taken off and uh, which is utilized in the larger scale prototypes that, um, that, we, that, that are now in existence is to do this hybrid sort of thing where there's a lithium ibate waveguide. It is pumped by a pulse pump laser of some kind. And so we generate a bunch of signal nodes by parametric down conversion, which now get inserted into quite a long optical fiber loop. And then they eventually come back around. But the way the couplings are implemented is that there's a place where as a pump pulse comes around, a small piece of it gets tapped off and measured in a homodyne measurement of the, uh, let's say, x quadrature. So this measurement will uh, sample the pulse to determine um, uh, to make an to, to allow you to make an estimate of its amplitude, and then all of those amplitudes get digitized and injected into uh, an electronic circuit like an FPGA. In fact, it is an FPGA in the current implementations. So what this FPGA has is it's got as a lookup table basically the entire JIJ matrix, which could include diagonal terms if you wanted it to. It's got a set of measured um, estimates of the amplitudes of each of the OPO modes. You just have to do then a matrix vector multiply, you get another vector out. And that vector uh, that you get out is a set of terms that you should use as little perturbations to each of the pump pulses as they come around. And so those perturbations are affected by um, taking um, another uh, optical field at the signal wavelength and then phase and amplitude modulating it such that it gives you the right perturbation and splicing it back into the fiber loop at another beam spitter a little bit downstream. Um, so, so this allows... Yes. Can I ask? I'm sorry. So, so if I understand right, the these modes basically in the fiber would not interact with each other, and so the FPGA is sort of synthetically creating the interaction. Yep. But so, is, if is there a problem if in another system? I mean, like I guess. Uh, what am I asking? Is there a reason? This is like getting around the physics in this particular fiber. In the other system you showed before, you just have the the interaction controlled by how you couple the the, the two bow ties to each other. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, you can. Uh, yeah. So here, what happens is, uh, you know, it's a good thing is that um, you can adjust the couplings on the fly if you wanted to, where it's very easy to see how you reprogram a different problem instance. Right? You just load a different lookup table into the FPGA. Um, on the downside, you know, as you get to large system sizes, right? So I've seen some prototypes that pretty large system size. I mean, this FPGA bank becomes the dominant piece of hardware involved in, in a large scale uh, CIM. And you know, some people have complained uh, or, or they've raised the issue that, well, if you're gonna give yourself that much electronic processing power, to what extent is that doing all of the heavy lifting in the e easing optimization and what is the optics even doing at all? But um, uh, as I'll, I'll, I hope to explain in the, in the last part of this talk, um, we really do think that the nonlinearity involved in the lasing threshold part of the dynamics um, associated with this uh, OPO dynamics. So the optical nonlinearity complements the linear coupling implemented in the electronics in a very critical way. Uh, so there is, there really is some sense in which you have some uh, division of labor um, between the optics and the electronics in the current generation of uh, measurement feedback. Um, but, but sorry, but but um, but uh, the FPGA is doing a calculation that is nonlinear, right? Or no, it's just a linear transformation, but there's like multiplication oh. going on. And yeah, I there... mean, yeah, it's it's bilinear in that sense, right? You have some constant parameter multiplying a, a variable, and then that's getting added to another variable. So in terms of the Hamil if, in terms of the equations of motion. It's it's uh, implementing a linear term in the equations of the motion, as I'll show you in a second. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and um, if I can ask just one more, sorry, question. Uh, the right now you're using like um, uh, self gain and and photon hopping as sort of the pieces of the puzzle. 
Do the other sort of parametric processes like, you know, uh, two mode squeezing, for instance, do those, are those sort of things that would plug in and be powerful or is it, is it sort of self gain plus photon hopping is all you really need? Um, I think it depends on your perspective. So uh, for the easing machine, the way that people are, are currently trying to develop them to large scale, um, you try to keep the OPO degenerate so that there's no two mode squeezing or anything like that. On the other hand, you know, looking at this uh, diagram as an optical physicist, you can just ask yourself, well, what happens if you take the OPO into non-degenerate operations so that you would get things like two mode squeezing? And I think something that we've started to understand is that um, rather than being really like a binary easing problem, if you go into something more like a non-degenerate OPO where you would get two mode squeezing, that brings you into something that's more like an XY model. And so part of what this points out is that once you start building hardware like this to try to embed your combinatorial optimization in an analog dynamical physical system, you can uh, not only tune parameters like the pump strength, but you can actually tune things like uh, whether your OPO is degenerate or non-degenerate. And that allows you to actually kind of make trajectories through model space, right? Like you'd imagine starting your computation as something like a, a soft spin easing model, introducing it to tuning to go into the XY model for a little while, and then taking that to tuning out and coming back to the easing model at the end. And so you start to think about how um, problems like the ground state easing problem is actually embedded in a much larger model space. And you know, the practical details of the physical things that you make may allow you to move around in that model space. And so you can ask about like, if there are local traps, you know, do they go away if you go into a different model for a while and then come back? Can you kind of go around local minima by excursions in model space? So I think there are a lot of very interesting questions that get raised by that. Uh, but for the moment, those are not things that we've explored in any, um, any rigorous kind of way. Uh, yeah. So um, just to you know, then be explicit about what this kind of um, uh, optimization then looks like. So you, you load the JIJ parameters into the FPGA. You um, start pulsing the pump laser, but initially at a very low amplitude. And so then um, in a way that's uh, at least uh, somewhat slow compared to the round trip time of the, uh, of the optical storage loop, you start to ramp up the uh, power of the pump. And so if you look at the sampled values of all of the state variables as a function of time or round trip number where the understanding is that the pump value is being increased. Initially, you just see small amplitudes for each of the OPO modes kind of wandering around like you're just sampling inside of that anti-squeeze quadrature of the squeezed vacuum. But then at some point you hit something like a thresholding transition and all of the OPOs kind of um, pop out to having a positive or negative displacement relative to the pump phase. And so in this particular setup, this is just a diagram from, uh, from this science paper from 2016 what you'll see is there, um, they've encoded a kind of a max cut problem. And so if you evaluate, I mean, if you just strictly take the signs of the amplitudes of all of the different OPOs at any given time as an estimate of a binary um, state, then um, at low pump hours, you're just basically seeing some noise. Nevertheless, you can still compute the figure of merit as a max cut ground state energy. But then once you come through threshold and everything's kind of popped out, you see that eventually you go to a, a much better figure of merit, which um, for this relatively small problem that was demonstrated here actually corresponds to what you can compute as the actual ground state of that particular problem. And so that's what a computation, that's what an optimization looks like using this kind of an architecture. And so, um, you know, at, at this point, everybody, uh, well, at this point, people often start to ask about benchmarking and how um, the CIM as an actual computer compares with uh, conventional approaches or other sorts of approaches. Um, the one extensive uh, benchmarking study that I know of is something that was led by uh, Ryan Hammerly a couple of years ago. It's appeared in Science It Advances. Um, and what's actually, uh, the, the study that's performed there is really to try to rigorously assess the performance of the um, at the time, state-of-the-art uh, CIM prototypes relative to the D-Wave um, 2000Q quantum annealer. And so the results are very interesting. They show you some things like if you're looking at small problem sizes and or sparsely connected graphs for an easing type problem, uh, the D-Wave quantum annealer is significantly faster than uh, the state-of-the-art CIMs. However, when you go to large problem sizes, and especially the large problem sizes with dense couplings, the it's effectively planar layout of physical qubits on a circuit board that you have in a superconducting uh, circuit like in the D-Wave quantum annealer 
it means that it really is not very good at trying to solve problems where there's a high degree of connectivity. Whereas in the coherent easy machine, since you have these things just traveling around in a loop, you kind of see that as long as your FPGA can keep up, there's nothing more difficult about implementing all the all couplings than there is in uh, implementing nearest neighbor couplings. So um, in some cases that actually were directly benchmarked, you can see that the coherent easing machine had something like a factor of 10 to the seven speed up over the D-wave 2000Q. And for large, say N equals 100, that, that's not even really that large, but for larger problem sizes with the dense couplings, um, you can't actually solve it on the D-wave 2000Q, but the estimated speed up factor is some you know, meaninglessly large number. So it, it starts to show you that this use of optics, right? Um, it really, uh, the key thing about it seems to be that it um, facilitates uh, the realization of very dense connections in this sort of an optimization problem. Now, you also can uh, try to do some comparisons of CIM as an algorithm or as an architecture in comparison to conventional heuristics that you would run on a, on a, on a regular computer. That business gets a little bit complicated. Um, maybe in light of the time, I'll just refer you off to um, there's a very nice paper, uh, first author was Tim Laleo, who came out in two, 2019, uh, referenced here, in which there um, is some comparison uh, or some evaluation of the relative speed of a CIM-based algorithm versus um, a leading heuristic uh, called breakout local search. So what is the current status of these sorts of machines? Well, so in 2016, um, there were a couple of papers, uh, actually, I should kind of maybe mix these two. So in that period of 2016 to 2018, the kinds of uh, prototypes that were being operated for those sorts of benchmarking studies, there was an academic setup uh, at Stanford University um, led by Peter McMahon and Alireza Morandi, um, which uh, operated as a 100 spin easing machine. Um, and at the same time, there was the development of a 2000 spin easing machine at NTT Basic Research Labs in Atsugi in Japan. And that work on building advanced prototypes at NTT is, is continuing. And they actually have some quite ambitious goals about the size of the prototypes that they want to have operating over the next couple of years. Uh, but maybe let, let me just say that um, they're targeting significantly larger um, number of spins than 2000 uh, while maintaining the ability to, to implement dense couplings. So that's sort of the experimental state of the art. Now, at the same time, we might ask, um, what is our understanding then of further scaling or to what extent do we really understand what's going on in combinatorial optimization in the CIM at all? So I would just toss out as some uh, kind Can of- Can I just of ask a quick quick question on, on just this part? Um, yeah. So suppose I wanted you to run a different JIJs. I mean, it, so it, it's basically reprogramming the FPGA table and running this, uh, you know, for a, a few loops, which is very fast and then popping up the answer, right? And then mm -hmm. the physical device has to be very stable, uh, mm -hmm. from what I understand, uh, right? I mean, it's at room temperature, it's sitting on a physical table and, and things of that type. Uh, uh, for, but from, from what I understand, it's very fragile. And uh, again, I'm, a, I'm looking at it from a user perspective. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it, it, it takes like months to run something that takes into the power minus three seconds. So I'm wondering <laughs> <laughs> if I look at the total time of I send you a, a GIJ matrix and you return me an answer, uh, how, how can we compress that time? So, um, you know, I've been to visit the, uh, the facilities at NTD Basic Research Labs, but uh, I'm not uh, privy to much of the technical work that goes on there these days. I will say that it certainly is true that um, since you're making something which is optical coherent, you do have a number of stabilization issues that need to be solved. And in an academic setting or in a prototype setting, um, the, the downtime of a complex kind of leading edge prototype can be significant. So you can have the kinds of problems that you said. Generally though, you know, stabilizing optical path lengths or stabilizing frequencies and phases of lasers, this is one of the things that we know how to do best in all of experimental physics. Like it's the kind of technology that goes into LIGO, right? I mean, there are known ways to solve these problems. So I think um, you know, the, the field presumably will evolve in a direction where if we decide that uh, these sorts of uh, architectures really are useful for practical problems, at some point the optical engineering will get done to, make, to give you 99% you know, uptime. And uh, you know, there's nothing qualitatively new that has to get done there. Uh, it's just, I think that the uh, effort so far has more been going into just getting to larger n. 
and getting that nailed down so that it's worth doing kind of the known engineering or something. Yeah, yeah, I would say. Um, yeah, so it, it is, but you know, so in terms of, so that's really the, I mean, actually that, that Q and A right there sums up something which is really kind of unusual about um, the work in coherent easing machines and that we're working on novel computing, but it's actually really an experimentally driven field, right? So because of the fact that people can build and at least intermittently operate very large prototypes, we have these uh, promising sorts of results that suggest that this may be a very interesting sort of heuristic for solving large complex optimization problems. However, we actually don't currently know enough about, or we don't have a clear enough understanding of really the basic operating principles of CIM to confidently uh, predict anything about how this stuff is gonna scale. And so that's really very weird, right? It's kind of the opposite situation to what we have in mainstream quantum computing. But in mainstream quantum computing, we have had for 25 years, a kind of theoretical proof that, um, that uh, standard quantum computing has uh, better scaling than conventional computing approaches. But even making pretty small systems, you know, do dozens of qubits, has taken decades of sustained effort and, and quite a lot of investment. So CIM is kind of in the opposite place where one company can uh, develop over the course of five or 10 years some quite large prototypes, but our theoretical understanding of what's actually going on in these machines is really lagging behind. So, you know, it's maybe a little bit more like a scenario that you would have these days in a topic like deep learning, where you can just go ahead and try it and you can see that it works. Uh, and it creates lots of interesting things for theorists to try to explain. And so I would kind of say that that's sort of where we're at in CIM. So I have a question. Is it at the NTT program, are they contemplating having a user program similar to, you know, what D-Wave and, you know, IBM and so forth uh, have been putting together? You know, they did have for a while. Um, there was a sponsored uh, cloud access program that was operating for a while. That ended, I think, because some some grant ended. And I uh, would imagine that they're planning on uh, restoring that kind of level of access, maybe after, you know, I think the entire team is busy right now trying to make the thing bigger. So, you know, they're maybe not worrying about the kind of stability and interface issues. But I certainly, in my understanding, I would certainly assume that that's in the, that's in the, the, the roadmap. So um, I think we've actually come up to an hour. I wanted to at least mention a couple of other things. Can I take another five minutes before we kind of go into? Oh yeah, please. I mean, I think the questions are being folded in. So yeah, we want to hear the punch, you know, all the, everything you want to say. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I, so, you know, I think the, the biggest advance that we've made in terms of trying to understand what's going on in terms of uh, how do we reason about the CIM as a, as a machine for doing optimizations uh, is to really switch perspectives from a computing uh, kind of perspective to a dynamical system sort of perspective. And so um, this diagram is hard to explain, but it, I think maybe we'll just give you a visual impression for the kinds of things I want to talk about. So if you would take a, a very classical picture of what's going on in a coherent easing machine, um, you could say at some level that there's an energy that you're trying to minimize. This energy is something that looks very much like an easing energy but then it also has some terms associated with um, uh, pumping and loss terms and also the uh, thresholding nonlinearity that you have in the FPOs. So there's an overall energy function that looks something like this. And the equations of motion for the um, CAM can actually be seen as gradient descent in this energy landscape. Um, now there's one caveat to that that I, I wanna make sure that I come back to, but um, maybe I'll, I'll explain that on the, last, on the next slide. And so, the thing that you can uh, see happening is that um, when the pump power is very low, nothing's really happening. And then as the pump power increases, you start to get certain kinds of uh, bifurcations in the dynamics, but there's not just a single one that instantly pops you into an easing type solution, the way that we were kind of imagining in a cartoon that I talked about a few slides ago. But actually in this diagram, there's like a whole cascade of lots and lots of bifurcations that actually happen as we think about um, tuning the uh, current easing machine landscape from very low pump powers to very high pump powers. And uh, the only two limits that we can understand very well are what are the first things that happen as you start turning up the pump? And then also what is the, what is the kind of phase portrait of the system look like when you're in the very high pump power regime? So in the very high pump power regime, something that you can show analytically, uh, and this is something that um, Atsushi Yamamura pointed out to me, at least uh, in our local community at Stanford, 
is that when the pump power is very high, you can show that um, there are local minima uh, for the energy, each one of which, if you just take the sign structure of the uh, OPO amplitudes, those give easing solutions. And uh, the lower easing energy solutions are at higher radius from the origin in this overall phase space. Right? So the, gra the global ground state of the easing Hamiltonian is the fixed point of the dynamics that's farthest away from the vacuum, right? that has the highest, uh, strongest degree of oscillation. So that actually does kind of correspond to the um, cartoon picture a little bit. On the other hand, when you think about this entire cascade of bifurcations that happens before that, another thing that you can show is that the very first bifurcation that happens is that you go from having the vacuum state as the unique fixed point of the dynamics to creating a pair of new fixed points and the vacuum gets destabilized. And these new fixed points are it go out exactly along the directions of the eigenvector of the JIJ matrix that has the lowest eigenvalue. So an interesting thing about that, right? So if you just take this JIJ matrix and think of it as a matrix, just uh, diagonalize it and take the eigenvector that corresponds to the smallest eigenvalue, that is a very well-known simplistic heuristic as a solution to the easing problem. It's not really a solution, right? Because that eigenvector is not going to have entries in it that are all just plus or minus one, right? They're going to be analog numbers in that eigenvector. But if you just take the sign structure of that thing, that's a heuristic for uh, solving the easing problem, but it's generally known not to be a very good one. But so this is the thing that happens that's sort of the, the pure influence of just the couplings. And so this is a, a step of the evolution that you could very reasonably attribute entirely to the FBGA electronics, right? Because that's what's actually implementing the JIJs in the real CIM dynamics. However, if you then follow along these uh, fixed point solutions as you increase the pump, what you see is that a sequence of sign flips actually then start to kick in, which take you away from that um, sort, sort of simplest lowest eigenvector approximation and start to pull you off to better solutions. And those things are very clearly associated with the nonlinear part of the dynamics. And so those are things that are contributed now by the optical nonlinearity. Uh, we also see from uh, numerical simulations of this sort of dynamics that when you're in a, an intermediate regime, so as the pump is very close to threshold, it really looks like the landscape becomes quite glassy. So you go into a regime where there are lots of local minima, those local minima have some very shallow directions and or some of those things, or maybe even many of those things in certain regions of phase space may actually be um, very low index saddle points. And so um, it's a, a thing that I want, well, let's see, what should I do here? Um, yeah, so it's a, you know, the, the kind of, I would say updated picture of what we're doing in the coherent easing machine is that you know that by the time you get to the very high pump limit, uh, there's a simple way to talk about the best solutions. They're the stable oscillations with the highest amplitudes. Those are the best easing solutions. And now kind of what you want to do is you want to understand how do we get into the basins of attraction of those very good solutions? But I'm not actually just jumping straight into this picture at high pump power. I'm going to start from low pump power and then sweep the pump power up. So apparently what we're doing is we're initializing somewhere. We would like all the dynamics in between to move us into the right parts of the phase space, such that when we get to the high pump power uh, regime, I'm going to get attracted into those very good solutions. And the easing problem is basically about how should I do this initialization and how should I vary the parameters such that I kind of move from my initial part of phase space out to those high amplitude regions without getting stuck for very long periods of time in shallow minima or low index saddles that occur in the middle. And you know, it, it's easy enough to say that. I, I would say that we have very little concrete understanding of how exactly to do that yet. Other than that, if you try it in a real hardware easing machine, it seems to work out pretty well. Um, another thing that I, I wanna point out just because it, it uh, helps to um, illustrate some uh, relationships that CIM physics has with other fields. So uh, I was mentioning that um, you can view the way the the CIM works is basically gradient descent in an energy landscape that corresponds to the easing Hamiltonian plus some nonlinear terms associated with the OPO threshold. But that actually only um, happens, right? So you, you can show that the mean field equations of motion for the CIM viewed as a classical device takes this form. Uh, and so if, you, if your actual implementation of the CIM, right, you actually sample every X uh, you know, as it comes around the loop and you calculate how to, how to correct every uh, X as it comes around. So actually in the hardware CIM, you have the freedom to uh, make this, this uh, effective coupling matrix either symmetric or you could make it non-symmetric if you wanted to, 
right? If you want to view the dynamics of the CAM as being gradient descent in this easing-like energy landscape, then you have to implement these couplings symmetrically. Uh, on the other hand, you're free to make them non-symmetric, and then your dynamics will be something else. Um, and a reason for thinking that that might be interesting is that um, there's quite a large literature largely based in the um, neuroscience community where people have looked at actually very similar equations of motion to represent very large networks of coupled neurons, so thresholding neurons, um, where the couplings are effectively random. And in those sorts of models, um, they actually assume that the uh, couplings are, are directed, right? So they assume no correlation between the way that uh, neuron I couples to neuron J and the way that uh, neuron J couples to neuron I. So when you get, go to that completely unsymmetric uh, limit, you can use a kind of mean field theory, mean field theory in the sense of statistical mechanics rather than quantum optics to draw a kind of phase diagram for what happens in these large networks of randomly connected uh, neurons. And you see some very interesting things like they still have this uh, low excitation regime where the vacuum effectively is the only stable state. There's a high excitation regime in which you'll have transient chaotic dynamics, but then settling down to local minima. And in between, you generally have a, a phase of chaotic behavior. And so you can uh, ask about maybe that chaotic behavior is an interesting thing for helping you to uh, you know, get through the glassy or uh, uh, kind of treacherous parts of the phase space. Now, um, in the symmetric coupling picture, uh, you can generally show that for really symmetric coupling, you don't expect to have this little chaotic regime in between. But you know, this chaotic regime might either be very good for our optimization dynamics, or it might be very bad for the optimization dynamics. We don't actually know. But uh, another thing that um, kind of on a theoretical uh, as a theoretical uh, research project that uh, Daniel Wenberg in our, our group has, Daniel Wenberg in our group has been studying, is to ask, well, if you intentionally made your couplings in the CIM non-symmetric, could you do a little bit of chaotic annealing in the middle of the optimization uh, trajectory that might help you uh, more, uh, more broadly explore parts of phase space to try to discover those basins of attraction that are gonna suck you into the really good solutions at high pump power? Or conversely, if it turns out that a little bit of chaotic dynamics is bad, um, how concerned should we be that in the actual implementations of a hardware uh, physical CIM, we may think that we're trying to implement completely symmetric couplings, but phase jitter or other things like that may actually be giving us a small anti, or a, yeah, small anti-symmetric perturbation. And maybe we really need to worry about that because maybe that's actually messing us up. But it's a very interesting, it's one very interesting point of contact between the work that we're doing in CIM and things that have traditionally been more of central concern in the neuroscience community. And as people who know this field uh, will know much better than I, there are lots of other connections that you can make to things in statistical mechanics, like uh, things that people have studied uh, spin glasses in Sher Sherrington Kirkpatrick models or the so-called TAP equations. So these are all things that we're, we're trying to, to get a handle on. And so the thing I think I'm not really gonna have any time to talk about, but that I at least wanted to mention was in setups like this, Right, we're used to, in quantum optics, we're used to talking about OPOs, not for classical spin physics, but for actually talking about squeezing and entanglement and other interesting uh, sorts of quantum mechanical things like that. And so let me just mention a couple of ways in which we think uh, we could try to pull that out and emphasize it. Um, let's see. So, uh, you know, a reason why, the basic reason why you don't really expect to have any entanglement in the large scale prototype CAMs, the way they're implemented, is that the interaction between the OPO modes is all done by uh, LOCC operations, right? So they're local operations and classical communication. So we don't expect those sorts of couplings to ever give us any entanglement. However, uh, something that Ryotatsu Yanagimoto in my group has worked out is that you can modify the setup slightly to actually measure um, uh, combinations of neighboring pulses and use something that's like an entanglement swapping protocol uh, to create a modified CIM architecture in which you could still try to do easing optimization, but where the, the setup of your measurements, you'd always be measuring two modes at a time. And so this is a setup that we show can be used to generate entanglement among the spins and something that looks very similar to the present day measurement feedback OPOs, just with much lower optical loss. And so we think this is an interesting way to, um, to uh, an interesting kind of model for exp to explore to see how much entanglement could actually make a difference in where you go in phase space and how those optimization trajectories really involve, evolve. 
And the um, other things I wanted to mention then are things that we're doing in collaboration with Marty Fair's group and with Amir Safavi Naini's group at uh, Stanford. So I'm um, talking first about the work with, oh, actually this is something that involves both of them, um, but the uh, very rapidly evolving capabilities in our community to construct nanophotonic devices using lithium nibate. And furthermore, to do things like very complicated dispersion engineering so that you can actually put ultra, ultra fast pump pulses into um, lithium nibate nanophotonic waveguides. Uh, so uh, it really seems that this is gonna be giving us the ability, I was very optimistic in how many slides to stick in here. <laughs> uh, it, it seems like this is really uh, gonna bring, give us the ability um, to think about um, making ultra fast nanophotonic OPO devices that could be construct that could be kind of built up to look very much like a CIM in which this combination of very tight transverse confinement that you have by using an nanophotonic waveguide and um, the density of modes that you pull in by using an ultra fast pump, it's possible that you could make um, devices that are like OPOs, but where the thresholds rather than corresponding to macroscopic optical powers would be in the few photon regime. And so uh, this would be, uh, we think that this would be a very interesting to re regime to look at in terms of uh, the difference in uh, quantum dynamical systems versus classical dy dynamical systems for this sort of optimization. Um, and furthermore, you know, maybe it won't go to quite as large a scale, um, or, but you know, a, another uh, technology in which we can start to investigate these sorts of things are in superconducting circuits, um, not like the, the kinds of architectures that are being pursued at D-Wave, uh, but Amir Safaviniani's group has really been looking at um, uh, parametric oscillators, uh, microwave parametric oscillators in superconducting circuits that ex uh, exhibit extremely quantum behavior um, already in, in the laboratory. And so I'll just uh, finish off by saying I, I hope that at least in this talk, I've managed to give you a pretty good overview of what coherent, coherent easing machines are, uh, what their structure is, to relate it to a class of applications that kind of give them a, a strong practical interest as a kind of uh, emergent architecture for computing, but also I've quickly gone over some of these connections where thinking about CIMs and trying to understand their physical operating principles, they connect you to this whole world of understanding how computing relates to dynamical systems theory. Um, there are very strong connections when we think about large uh, optimization problems to random matrix theory and problems of spin glasses. And then in terms of thinking about how we want this architecture to evolve in the future and become more quantum, um, some of the very interesting uh, connections we can pull out relate to uh, the kinds of device physics that people are working on for other aspects of uh, quantum information science, including thinking about trying to make optical parametric oscillators with very low thresholds, even in the few photon regime, where you expect to be able to um, explore highly non-Gaussian states uh, and, uh, and to have things like pulse-to-pulse -pulse entanglement. So uh, yeah, thanks for letting me go over time and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Uh, that was really uh, that was wonderful, an amazing uh, overview uh, of, of this uh, this field. And I think, uh, well, I, I've asked a few questions already, so I'm maybe I'll open it up now to our, our Zoom uh, uh, audience um, to see if uh, some of you uh, like and uh, ask some questions. Otherwise, I think that we we have uh, at least one question I know from the chat window. What? Hideo, the, um, you said that there might be stuff for the sort of order 10 uh, qubit or sorry, 10 mode quantum. In that, in that sort of area, what's the, the key thing, I guess, that you want to show? Because as you point out, some of these superconducting systems we build as like multi-parametric uh, amplifiers are basically that system. Uh, we just, of course, operate below threshold, so everything's linear. Yeah. I, um... Let me see if I can back off to a good place. Yeah, so I kind of skipped an introductory slide here, just kind of showing what face portraits are. You know, um, uh, on this slide here, just showing a face portrait diagram. Some of you have seen these in your physics or mechanical engineering classes. But the idea is that if I have a system whose dynamics is uh, expressed by a couple dynamical equations, I can sort of, if you know, in a very simple two-dimensional system, I can really um, visualize the dynamics. Where if I have a pair of couple of variables x and y, for every point in the phase space, I can draw a little arrow which shows me the right-hand side of the equations of motion. And so, if I'm sitting at some point in phase space, I can figure out where I'm going to go just by kind of following the arrows. 
And so, um, you know, the sorts of things that we think are, are critical in the um, evolution of the coherent easing machine are as we increase the pump power, how is this vector field changing? And so how does it direct us from the initial states that we've prepared towards what we hope are going to be very good uh, easing solutions? And what's interesting, though, is that, OK, you can do this. Uh, you can do this kind of thing with classical equations in motion for the CIM. But if you now try to lift those to a quantum mechanical version of the CIM, you got to do something like imagine wave packets evolving on this sort of a vector field. And so I think the sorts of things that would be very interesting to study are, to what extent um, do interference effects actually play some role in how you transport probability through complex regions of, of the phase space like this? You know, like if it's true that you go through some glassy phase in the dynamics when the pump is very close to threshold, you're going to have like lots of fixed points with very some very shallow, unstable uh, manifolds around them. And so as we move through there, is there some sense in which a wave packet moving through that sort of region will have less of a propensity to get stuck than point-like classical trajectories or even point-like classical trajectories with some classical noise? And so uh, the kinds of things that we've been discussing at Stanford are imagining um, superconducting circuits where you would try to um, create dynamics that in the mean field limit have an interesting sort of phase portrait like this. And just to study how do the quantum states evolve in, in a complex sort of phase portrait as opposed to how those classical systems uh, would evolve in the analogous uh, um, dynamics. OK, so uh, other questions from our, our audience, our local audience? Well, I have some experience with D-Wave, and so I was looking forward to working more with CIM, and, and that's where I'm a business school professor trying to find new ways of doing things. Um, yeah, with D-Wave 2000Q, for example, as you mentioned, because of connectivity requirements, uh, you can't do dense things, you can't do large things anyway. And they also have the chain breaking when you, uh, when you create chains, uh, because you, you can't... Uh, and a lot of uh, the action actually takes place to cover the chain and, and you know the chain breaks and so on. So I think there's a limit to what uh, a D-Wave can, can accomplish uh, anytime soon. By, by D-Wave, I mean any architecture of that type. So I think uh, this architecture, as you mentioned, the fact that you can you can go up to many uh, many to many coupling uh, already gives a, a, you know a larger scale of, of, of potential uh, things to solve. Um, and and where uh, where I was uh, going was you know the, the stability of, of of this and then having an ability to do practical things, but also what do you think are the first theoretical things that you can do? As you said, it's an interesting situation. You mentioned like deep learning; it kind of works. Nobody knows why it works, uh, so, uh, 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 right? But it leaves you with a bad feeling that it's a black box. Uh, uh, here, at least, I think you have an understanding of what the optics are able to do, what the FPGA is doing, how we are perturbing things, why things can get the nonlinearity and move towards stuff. So do, do you see, uh, what do you see as some of uh, the theoretical uh, uh, kind of constructs you can create so that people can do some analysis in some sense uh, of what to expect? Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, what I'm uh, trying to get us moving towards uh, just in my own little group at Stanford is to work actually with uh, just um, simulation models of the CIM so that we can ask not only uh, what are the states, but we can try to map out really what the whole base portrait looks like. And I think, you know, a huge question that we could start trying to answer is for relatively small problem sizes. So for a few dozen spins, let's say, can we start to um, draw connections between certain kinds of problem instances and what the phase space looks like for the actual dynamical system, that you might imagine that for problems that are computationally simple, the phase space should also be relatively simple. Whereas when we talk about the really um, complicated problem instances, maybe that's where all the glassy stuff happens. And maybe that's going to be uh, causing us either to have a very slow solution or generally not to be able to get very close to the, to the optimum uh, ground state. And so that's the kind of thing that I think that just with the exhaustive numerical uh, computation, uh, just to understand the properties of this dynamical system, if we can start to make a connection between computational complexity and kind of phase-based dynamics complexity, that would be a really interesting step to, to make. And you know, at the same time, we're trying to understand something about 
um, you know, what does N have to be before we kind of get to the asymptotic regime where we're looking at typical behavior for a large N? There's a suggestion, I mean, so far the work suggests that you need to actually get to N is equal to like a thousand or maybe even 10,000 before you're really in that large N limit. That's going to be challenged, challenging to really study those things in, in great detail at that size. But hopefully we'll get some qualitative ideas from looking in a very detailed way at small problems. And then we can try to uh, examine the way in which those things do or don't survive when you get to, to larger problems. It just, I, you know, I, I didn't manage to mention, but I just, just did want to uh, just show this one slide where in, in this uh, NSF expeditions project that we have, um, you, we really are going to try to take a team approach to look at all these four different areas where there are fundamentals of understanding what CIM is and exploring generalizations that would be more quantum mechanical in nature. Uh, you know, those are things that we're doing within the, within the project. But there also are parts of the team that are really much more focused on applications and benchmarking. And so I think there will continue to be a lot of work done with the D-Wave uh, quantum annealers, largely through um, the COIL group at, uh, at uh, USRA at NASA. And so we have some people on the team over there who uh, really are very experienced in the kind of applied algorithmics and really trying to make fair benchmarking of different kinds of applications across platforms. And so this think, is the Davide Venturelli and Eleanor Rifle. That that group is is that is that the group? yeah exactly yeah. Uh, you know, and so uh, what I was going to say is also since Yoshi is still involved involved in this uh, this project, uh, there's the hope that he's going to well he he is meant to be getting us access to the large prototypes in NTT basic research labs to really start doing some extensive benchmarking on those as well. Okay, so uh, Jenny, do we have a, a, a the question from? Uh, yeah, um, so um, Phil Shank asked, he had a, an earlier question that it seems like you answered, but he wanted to know some of your thoughts on the parallels between um, these OPO variables and classical computing variables. Um, let's see. So, uh, I'm a little unsure on what level that question is being asked. <laughs> well, he's an undergraduate in my, in, my, in my lab, so. Ah, OK, perfect. So um, uh, let me just try to find a good picture to talk with. So this is maybe a good one. So you know, if we think about the amplitude of the signal field in uh, an optical parametric oscillator, it's an oscillator and we're talking about an amplitude, right? So really fundamentally, these variables are analog variables. They can take you know, any real value. So they're quite different than the binary values that you would have in a conventional sort of computation. What we rely on though, is that the dynamics of the OPOs are such that they have a phase of the dynamics when the pump is relatively weak, where the amplitudes are really kind of behaving freely like analog continuous quantities. But once the pump gets large enough, this lazing dynamics takes over and really starts to kind of concentrate the probability for what those amplitudes will be onto a kind of a binary pair of states. And so, um, you know, I, I initially talked about this lazing transition, this pitchfork bifurcation for a single OPO in terms of this very simple diagram where for low pump powers, the only stable amplitude is zero. And once we've gone th above threshold, there are, are two stable values, one positive and one negative. So you kind of create a bit when you cross through this threshold but below the threshold, you don't have anything at all. But if you look at some simulations of this sort of a system, what you see is that for really low pump powers, indeed, your amplitude is just going to be zero. But then as the pump power approaches threshold, you'll expect to have some fluctuations in the amplitude that are sort of continuous in nature. But then when you're well above the threshold, you actually really then settle into just one of two binary values. So it's a kind of thing that will sometimes be called like a soft spin or something like that, where it's a sort of a variable where early in the uh, computational uh, schedule, so when the pump power is low, it kind of behaves like a, a real number. But then late in the pump schedule, when the pump strength is very high, it behaves more like a bit. And so some of the kind of uh, really core theoretical questions we're trying to understand are, in what ways is that good? In what ways is that potentially bad? Uh, but it, in any case, it's, it's something very different. <laughs> For, for thinking about um, this, these sorts of optimization problems. Thanks. Well, I think this is a great, uh, great place to um, 
you know, to, to stop. And uh, again, I really want to uh, thank uh, you, Hideo, for, for your time and uh, for giving a really great overview of this really exciting field. Um, and uh, it just helps to show like, the breadth of um, what people are doing and it, it's not all just, um, you know, qubits and, uh, uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a much broader, uh, richer variety that involves, you know, information computation, dynamics and, uh, and so forth. So, um, so thank you again for uh, kicking off our distinguished QI lecture series and uh, uh, all the best in your, um, your NSF uh, award. It's a really uh, impressive achievement and all the work that you've done so far is really great. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. All right, so that, uh, that wraps it up and uh, uh, thanks again. And uh, thanks to the audience here and all of you out there listening. Mm -hmm. So until next time. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks for setting it up, uh, Jeremy. For uh, I think I also enjoyed the interview that the tape that was done before. Uh, <laughs> uh, given that I'm an outsider, it was nice to see Hideo, your background, and obviously you're from Princeton to Caltech, and and and, and then through. I also liked a very early slide, if I may, uh, where you showed that you're, uh, you're coming from the bottom rather than uh, tunneling and others. Uh, maybe one way to think about it is as long as you're in that continuous world, you're kind of, you know, you're, you're not even in the zero one space. You're kind of, you're doing something. And only when you pump it, uh, you hope that when you get pumped, as you said, you'll, you'll end up uh, with the right zero ones already. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to connect back to your early slide uh, uh, so it's almost like pre pre bifurcation. You're below. You're you're not even you're not even you're not even there. And the minute you pump, you want to be in the right in the right in the right zone. I mean, uh, you know, that's a whole different way than thinking about already being binary and searching uh, through. If you think about all the walks we do, uh, we are already binary and we are trying to not get stuck in the wrong hole and things of that type. And you are basically saying, let me not get to binary until the very end. Uh, so maybe there's another way of framing this is uh, uh, the search, the, the how, how you're coming there is entirely different. Basically. So yeah, I mean, a way that we often try to visualize that is if you think about really a binary register, geometrically, you're talking about the corners of a high dimensional hypercube, right? right? But of course, that hypercube can just be embedded in a linear space of the same dimension. Right. And so if you only want to work with binary variables, you start somewhere on that, on some corner of that hypercube, and you're trying to jump corners to try to get to a minimum. Yeah, I Whereas we, I think what we do in CIM is we actually start in the center. We start at the origin of the space inside the hypercube and we try to move out. And you know, in some cases that might be a better strategy, in some cases that might be a worse strategy, but yeah. It, it's yeah but I like think it. your point is it's a different strategy and that's the point, I mean, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. So well, okay. that's a... Uh... Thanks again. That's a really uh, great talk and exciting to see these developments. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, see you guys later.